The day will never arrive when you finally have everything under control. When the flood of emails has been contained, when your to-do lists have stopped getting longer, when you're meeting all your obligations at work and in your home life, when nobody's angry for you missing a deadline or dropping the ball sometimes, and when the fully optimized person that you have become can turn at long last to the things that life is really supposed to be about. Let's start by admitting defeat. None of that is ever going to happen. That was a quote from the book 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman, a book about productivity and time management for mortals. It is based on the premise that we are all going to die and the over-optimized life for work and economic output with time boxing and calendar obsessions is actually a negative sum game. It's this efficiency mindset that arrived as part of the commercialization of everything that shifted our priorities away from our social and creative nature and is making our lives worse and inducing existential overwhelm everywhere. Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast. Of course, we need to remember that time is our most precious resource and it's time scarcity that makes it so valuable. Yet, time management is a skill that many of us find so difficult to master. Oliver Berkman emphasizes that we should culture the opposite, perhaps, of the hustler mentality, because the hustler mentality is just constantly saying to optimize for just achievements that we're told that we should seek at the cost of our own actual life. Now, whether you agree with this statement or not, I think it's always good to be curious on both sides of the arguments to see what could be learned from whatever you already know. And I found it's a really interesting book that I did agree with many of the things to help people become more happy with their lives and really think about the goal of what they are trying to achieve before they sort of waste their life, perhaps achieving the things that they may regret as they're dying. When you consider that it is basically impossible to truly master your time anyway, it does make sense to perhaps spend less of that scarce time prioritizing how to manage your time and spend more of that time enjoying it. Now, the book makes many useful points. And instead of trying to say everything in the book, like you could read the book, but I'm going to teach you the seven most valuable tips from the book. Where did our time obsession come from and why? How to balance existential overwhelm? What is the efficiency trap and how should you avoid its ironic inefficiencies? What can we learn by embracing procrastination? How can we make our life more fun? Plus a few of my own ideas on that and how to focus on our riching whatever time we might have left. So firstly, where did our efficiency mindsets come from? Because humans actually didn't care that much about time before it was an important factor. And it was actually something that we invented. Cats, apes, sharks, they have no concept of time as such besides just days and seasons. That's about it. And when you look at history humans didn't have to observe time as much. Even when it was invented, they still didn't bother to organize time being the same in every single location until it started being important for like communications. In medieval times, people were mainly thinking about their main daily life struggles and like, okay, they're going to do some farming today, but that's about it. When we started having factories and the economic output per worker really started tracking our time to see how people were performing versus how much time they had and how much they were going to get paid, that the whole efficiency mindset really started to build and build. And it was really just a commercialized asset as they realized that time was part of the resource that they wanted to make the most of. So before that, humans naturally didn't try to organize or optimize everything in their day and their workflow constantly to save time because they just enjoyed doing the thing they were doing until they needed to do something else. Now, this really helped with stress and anxiety because people weren't so pressured by deadlines and limited hours, and they just thought about the bigger picture. Of course, technological development and general economic output of the world was much less, but if people were feeling better about themselves, it does seem that maybe there is a case to enjoying your life more by not clock-watching so much and trying to be efficient with every single second. Ultimately, it's the constant pressure of managing our time that leads us to forget the end goal and enjoying life as it is which leads to the next point about existential overwhelm. This is based on the principle that we have limited time, but there's so many things we want to do. Oliver Berkman has a great quote here saying, we've been granted the mental capacities to make almost infinitely ambitious plans, and yet practically no time to put them all into action. 
And that's part of why we have existential overwhelm. We kind of realize that we can't do everything, but we want to do everything. And that makes us feel like a failure from the start. And existentially, like whatever we do is pointless because it's still not going to help us on our goal to achieving all of the dreams that we have. And so we're still going to be unsatisfied and you get existentially overwhelmed and unhappy with whatever you do. To overcome existential overwhelm, he suggests a technique popularized by Warren Buffett, or at least a story about Warren Buffett, where apparently one day Warren Buffett was on a plane with, I think it was the pilot, who was like, Warren, how have you achieved so many useful things with your life? I mean, I really want some help. And Warren was like, okay, well, this is what you're going to do, son. Write me a list of the 25 biggest goals in your life. The pilot goes away and he writes a long list of all these things. Oh, he's amazing. I'm going to be able to achieve all these things once he tells me how to do these things. And then he goes back to Warren Buffett. Then Warren Buffett says like, draw a line under number five and those bottom 20 of the 25, you must never do. Only work on those top five because life is too short to actually try and do all of them well. And it's more importantly to just work very hard on your most prioritized goals and save any lesser goals to just like brush over as quickly as possible or not spend any time on. Because ultimately, the more that we want to do, the less we accomplish. So it's important to try to accomplish less and to actually accomplish it. Because otherwise, the existential overwhelm leads to existentially doing bugger all. And that leads on to the efficiency trap, because the more efficient that we become at getting things done and ticking things off on our to-do list, the more things that we want to put on our to-do list. And then the more efficient that you become at something, the more you tend to do it. So this is why it's so important to practice strategic underachievement. That means you should underperform on many low important activities or decisions that don't matter should just try and take as quickly as possible because they can be changed or aren't going to impact your life that much. And then you should be excellent at only a very few key activities that you can put your full brilliance into and get the rewards back from them. And so the summary from these two lessons is that you should have open and closed lists. So you can keep all of your goals on some closed lists that you don't edit, but only have three or five goals in your open list. And that's the list that you actively work on and that you're allowed to put any time into. And only when a goal has been moved out of your open list because it is finished, are you allowed to go into your closed list and start working on something else? Otherwise, you'll overwhelm yourself and not get much done. And now, considering this is a book about like not getting things done, it's actually a book about getting things. And it's at this point that you realize that this book about not getting things done is actually a book about getting things done just from the opposite perspective because it definitely makes you more efficient <laughs> in your life and more successful as well as telling you to um, enjoy yourself which goes on to the next section about embracing procrastination because we're always complaining about procrastination and not like working on the thing and just wasting our time but procrastination is a very important part of creativity and it gives your brain the time to actually sort of think about different ideas and come up with solutions to things that you wouldn't have thought about when you're just trying to take the direct straight line. And it's also the place where you can be curious and just sort of read into stupid things and like embrace your odd obsessions that might actually give you some really interesting insights to better solve the problems that you wouldn't have solved in the best way if you just tried to do it without any time out. And I think it's important to remember that everybody procrastinates. Even the most successful people procrastinate, like the gurus, motivational speakers, top performing CEOs, athletes, they still spend time just sort of fudging around. And it's perfectly okay to allow yourself to do that as well. And if you don't allow any unstructured time in your life and you try to manage every day perfectly, it becomes an unhealthy approach to life, which you'll actually have to ditch sooner or later Kind of like the perfect diet is the imperfect diet that actually allows you to sort of slightly mess up a bit because the imperfect diet that you follow is a diet that you could keep following and keep doing. But the overly perfect diet that would be the best thing for your health, but that you actually sort of mess up and then you just don't get back on is worse. In the same way with your time, completely rigid structure with no allowing for messing up will always fail because you will always mess up sometimes and have some days where you don't quite meet all your like very strict standards. So if we instead embrace procrastination as something that can be good and actually helps us work harder when we are working, then we'll just breathe a lot more easily and like procrastinate properly and relax properly as opposed to just trying to work when we're not working and just being busy without getting anything done is terrible. And certainly it's something with people like me with ADHD often try and do is just try and like 
cram things into the day the whole time and you just spend the whole day not getting anything done and feeling terrible about it because you have like these five different goals and you're going nowhere. Whereas if you just go like, right, I'm not going to do anything for an hour and then I'm definitely going to do something for an hour, you'll actually do it and definitely a game changer. And on the topic of enjoying what you do more is literally enjoying what you do more by making it fun. Now, if you're working with colleagues and you're having meetings, how can you make that meeting more enjoyable just by like adding some funny comments or like a bit of a game to get to know each other and just being more curious about what's going on in it as opposed to just making it too structured and boring and then just reframing how you think about the work you have to do. Because ultimately, if you're only looking at the finished product as the goal, like what you want to have done, the doing it seems like a chore. But if instead you think of as the work as the goal of like the journey that you get to go on and like the finished product is like something that happens, then you should be optimizing for enjoying the work as it happens. Now that might mean completely changing your life to be able to work on things you enjoy, or it might just mean a different attitude to how you approach your work and realizing that it can be more enjoyable. But I think it's a very important mindset to realize that work is your life And yes, it doesn't have to be like flowers and rainbows the whole time, but it should be challenging in a way that you actually enjoy it and feel like you're learning and are doing something useful with your time. And if you're doing something useful with your time, that is something that you should be enjoying. And actually, you can just tell yourself that it's what you want to do because it feels great to do things that are kind of hard and push you. Another thing I've really found to help me like just enjoy a situation, whether it's quote unquote bad or good is to prioritize the story element of it. So if you have a few choices to make, you may as well go for the more interesting one that would be a better story to tell to others, but also a more interesting story to live yourself. And secondly, when things are going wrong or feel bad, think of them as an event in your life that is unique, it isn't going to happen again. And it's just like this wonderful experience that is kind of beautiful and interesting just to look at and perceive as it's happening and just like take in the moment and be like wow this is crazy it's all going nuts but it will work out and I can kind of enjoy the process of it being terrible to the point where it works out as a unique thing that I'll look back on with some kind of fondness even if it's technically a terrible situation that really does help me like feel a bit more calm in the moment and enjoy it as opposed to like crap I have to get out of this problem And often means you get out of the problem faster because you don't panic and make some silly mistakes. Another great concept in this area is the concept of being the main character in your life, which means that let's say you are reading the story of your life, as we were just saying, like trying to optimize for interesting stories. But also when you read a story, when a character is introduced, you kind of know where they're going in life. It's a story of someone that like, is going to the gym a lot? Or is this a story of someone that's like writing every day and working out how to improve what they're writing on? Or is this the story of someone that like get to the end of the day, was annoyed at their work and just watches Netflix all evening and doesn't really work on any of their problems. And just by like writing down what it is that they're doing, you already know where they're going to be in five years time, in 10 years time. And if you think of yourself as the main character in this story, it's like, okay, maybe you should be the character that does follow a healthier diet and go to the gym every day because that's really going to stack up over this character's time. And if the character wants to be a YouTuber, then yeah, they should be someone that makes a video every week and like slowly makes them better and better. And actually in a few years time, you kind of know that that person is going to have some really good videos that people are noticing. Whereas if there's someone that just like wants lots of people to look at their videos, but doesn't spend any time making videos, you know they're never going to be successful. And so when you think of yourself as the main character in the story that you're reading, it becomes a bit more obvious what that character should be doing. And I think it's a really good way to get some perspective on your life and actually just be like, okay, this is what I should do. I'll just do that. And helps you work out on the 25 goal list. And back to the concept of having 25 goals and only working on four or five of them. I think that really helps you understand which of the goals you should be doing. Because like, Someone that's working on 25 goals, you know, isn't going anywhere. But someone that actually has some focus, you're like, yeah, that person is going to achieve things and that's who I want to be. So if you follow the advice of writing down your 25 goals and then also apply this main character concept to them and be like, okay, (laughs) what is myself going to be working on? You're a bit like, yeah, it becomes a bit more obvious. And now wrapping this all up, enriching is the final concept around enriching your remaining weeks. This has two main areas. One is that there's only so many weeks that you're alive for. The book is called 4,000 Weeks. And when you think of it like that, it does start to become a bit more obvious 
that you will die and that every week you use is part of like your limited amount of time on this earth and something that you should probably put a bit more effort into enjoying and doing the things that are fun stories for you as opposed to just going through the motions of productivity, etc. And there's a really good poster that you can now buy online that's got like the amount of weeks that you're going to live for. Each one is like a tick box, so you can like tick where you are each every week as you go along, and it just sort of shows the countdown towards the end of your life. And it's just a really good little motivation to, you know, take that holiday, go see that friend, make sure you work on that project. And it's just a really nice little kick that just like hits you somewhere in your brain that, you should be hit. And the other part of this concept is to think about last time reflections. Because if you think about every experience that you have as possibly being the last time you experience it, it does then put you in a better place to like enjoy it and just savor the different feelings that you're feeling as something to just be interested and embrace as opposed to panicking and running away from. As I was saying with, if something is like a bad thing, but you think of it as the last time, it's not such an overwhelming, scary feeling that makes you want to panic, but it's instead something that you can be interested in and think about logically how to solve without it being something that's like really damaging to your mental health. And you can kind of just get through it whilst enjoying it. So in summary, 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals is a book that actually has a lot of good ideas It calls itself the anti-productivity book, and yet it is full of very good productivity advice whilst also maintaining your happiness. And I found it very useful for myself. It's helped with a few of my own personal things and just been a healthy reminder on some of the other things that I was already working on. And so if you haven't read it, I would recommend it. And if not, then I hope this was enough for you to have a few ideas for yourself about how you live life. Now, I know life is short, but if you could spare five seconds to give me a good rating i'm sure that would make you feel better about yourself as well as helping the podcast look cool on all the podcast players and now back to the advice on life which is life is to be enjoyed which starts with enjoying today so be nice to yourself and whilst you're at it be nice to someone else too thanks for listening